So one of the things we're going to talk about is this idea of cultural essentialism. One interesting example that I've seen a lot recently is a document called White Supremacy Culture. Uh, this is uh, from the workbook or from like a diversity training book called Dismantling Racism, a workbook for social change groups by two diversity trainers, Kenneth Jones and Tima Okun. And the reason I'm bringing this this uh, text up is because it's really been everywhere since the racial reckoning began in 2020, right? Um, and and I want to say for my own, you know, for my own background, I was actually first exposed to this text a few years ago uh, when I was working at a progressive nonprofit. And at the time, uh, I was like, this is one of the worst things I've ever read. Like, it's truly an awful text. But and, and I complained to friends about it afterwards, uh, you know, after I was sort of exposed to it at work. But I also thought at the time, well, this is just a niche professional activist thing. Like, don't like don't get all worked out. It's it's you know, no, nobody takes this stuff seriously. OK, so fast forward to 2020. Like I said, this text is appearing everywhere. Um, and, and I'll get into some of the places where I think it's been sort of most prevalent in a little bit. Uh, but first, I want to read just the opening paragraph from this text, which kind of lays out what they, what it is that these two authors are trying to do. So they write, this is a list of characteristics of white supremacy culture that show up in our organizations. Culture is powerful precisely because it is so present and at the same time, so very difficult to name or identify. The characteristics listed below are damaging because they are used as norms and standards without being proactively named or chosen by the group. They are damaging because they promote white supremacy thinking. So I think it's now worth going through a few of those characteristics. And then, Paul, I definitely want to get your take on some of them. Um, but but here's the list of white supremacy uh, culture characteristics. So it includes things like perfectionism, a sense of urgency, worship of the written word. Uh, we see here power hoarding, uh, objectivity, uh, right to comfort. Um, and, you know, I think because this text is now so widespread, it has come under fire. Um, I think, you know, from a lot of conservatives and people on the right, to be honest, who really take issue with the idea that, say, perfectionism is a trait of whiteness, right? Um, and, you know, if you are to read uh, the document White Supremacy Culture in like total bad faith, it does seem like they're arguing at times that like perfectionism is a trait of whiteness or like writing is like something that like, you know, white people do. I mean, that's if you really, if you really want to, um, I don't know, like take the text at its absolute worst. And I have some additional comments to make about some of the characteristics that appear. But Paul, first, I want to get your opinion on uh, some, some, some of these characteristics. And I also want to ask you if you, a teacher, have encountered this text or, you know, as, as a labor organizer, whether you've encountered this text, because like I'm saying, I, I, it really is everywhere these days. Yeah, well, where to start? Um, you know, and I know we're going to watch a clip soon where I'll have more thoughts, but I mean, one thing I immediately thought, I mean, with some of these characteristics, it's hard for me to believe they did not exist among societies that before white European context. So are you telling me that power hoarding in any sort of form did not exist in um, early African societies? Defensiveness. Think, right. Or, I mean, then there's a line in there, quant quantity over quality. And we'll get into the thing about math and science, but what about, you know, when the Islamic world was far ahead of Europe in, in terms of math and science, you know, so it, it's just, it's a little hard to, to swallow like that. And even, you know, I, I've encountered this more in the sense of within left organizations, not really as a teacher yet. I'm, that's probably coming Knock more and more. <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, also, I mean, it's, it, it gets, I think, a little bit absurd mm -hmm. when you think about it, because, you know, I, I think about, you know, what about the great um, independence, anti-colonial movements throughout Africa in the 20th century? I mean, you think the uh, African National Congress in South Africa, I think they operated with a sense of urgency. Yeah, probably <laughs> I was going to say all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this stuff in there about, you know, numbers. I mean, what about you need to count votes? I mean, to, to win an election, you know, it. And again, maybe some people say I'm reading that in very bad faith, but it just seems very strange to put, say that as a, a, a feature of white culture, um, mm -hmm. some of these things listed, mm -hmm. you know. So I... I I want to kind of play uh, Angel's Advocate, I guess, mm. and read this document in like perfectly good faith, right? Uh, if we go back to the document and look at some of the characteristics, like, again, perfectionism or a sense of urgency, like, 
let's say let's say that too much of these traits actually do make a workplace a little bit worse off. Like, let's look at this document as just a workplace training text and admit that, you know, if there's too much defensiveness or like either or thinking or like whatever, any number of characteristics on this chart, it could actually make somewhere a less pleasant place to work. I'm willing to give them that. Um, however, at the same time, I suppose I would argue that these are still not necessarily traits of whiteness, right? Like if your boss is engaging in, you know, a sense of urgency that is counterproductive by which, I mean, we in, you know, the labor organizing world, you may call that a speed up. Uh, that is something that is a function of the relationship between the employer and the employee that has nothing to do with whiteness. And I don't see how it's strategic or useful to say that that's a trait of whiteness. Um, and then if we look at something like worship of the written word, um, I, I mean, I that's always my favorite one because, you know, in at the very like worst faith end of the spectrum, that's kind of like suggesting that non-white people are worse at writing than their white counterparts, which is just racist. Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, even if we if we look at worship of the written word as like a quality of a workplace that can be kind of toxic, like, OK, I can see that there's something there like you need to have everything in a memo. If you didn't write it down, like it doesn't exist. I think these are the examples that the authors give in in their workbook. Right. Um, and again, OK, like I can see how, you know, that might be a little annoying or whatever. But I also want to point out that when you are an employee in a workplace, um, writing things down is actually really good for you if you have to perhaps later document sexual harassment, uh, file a, you know, union grievance, uh, if you have to, if you're going to sue for discrimination later, I mean, writing things down is actually a, uh, uh, is something that you really should be doing for yourself as a worker, especially if you're up against management in any kind of, uh, combative or, um, I guess, uh, uh, what's the word? Like, just, just if you're having an issue with management, right. right? So, so again, I think that these suggestions at best maybe describe some sort of annoying ticks of like less good workplaces, uh, but they're still they, they still have nothing to do with white supremacy. Um, and then at worst, I think that they go so far as calling things that could be beneficial to workers, such as the written word, white supremacy, which again is right. totally counterproductive. So and. And, you know, and to be fair, I have not read this whole text, but um, I mean, I would imagine people, if they were trying to defend it, would try to posit this as being in line with some, again, some sort of pre-European mm -hmm. African culture. And uh, I mean, there's many problems with that. I mean, OK, if you're talking about the written word, yes, we know oral history has been and still is a big part of uh, cultures in different part parts of Africa, different parts of the world. But, you know, first of all, I think we can know and acknowledge that. Um, Again, even before European contact, Africa, large continent, many different cultures that we can't generalize. But even, you know, we we know that, for example, like the empire, some of the empires in West Africa, like Ghana, were, uh, you know, engaged in some form of conquering. Maybe we wouldn't call it imperialism or colonialism in that sense, but they were involved in wealth uh, gathering and, and, and power grabbing in, in their different ways. Again, it's a different character than imperialism, but... Um, again, the, I just want to say, sorry, I just want to interrupt you to say that wealth gathering, I think, is going to be the next euphemism for capitalism. Yeah, I, it's funny. I don't know Paul. why I uh, said that. It's almost like I'm like capitalism's PR person all of a sudden. <laughs> right. um, yeah, a, a new career change for Paul. It's like it's like hunting and gathering. Uh, wealth, yeah. wealthing, wealthing and gathering. Anyway, um, <laughs> you guys heard it here first on the Jacobin Show. Keep an ear out for wealth gathering. Right. It's funny. I, I'm going to look out for that now in the New York Times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, again, it, it just it really does, doesn't doesn't hold up to like real historical analysis. And, mm -hmm. and again, and some things for just generally, especially in like a left, if it's supposed to be for a left organization or social justice organization. I mean, the big one, I mean, sense of urgency. I mean, that's to me, very key in campaigns. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it should be key, I think, in the world generally right now when you're thinking mm. about issues like climate change. So that that one just strikes me as a little strange um, in general. I would personally like more urgency around the topic of Medicare for all. Right. Um, 
So, yeah. I, um, so, yeah. so I guess I want to I want to add here. Why are we even talking about this text? Like, we obviously hate it, and I think. So like I was saying before, this text is completely widespread now. And like that really troubles me. Um, Matt Iglesias, who, of course, is I think he used to work for Vox. Uh, he's a freelance journalist now. Uh, he wrote a, a great article in his newsletter about kind of the spread of white supremacy culture, the text. Um, he has a pretty funny list of all of the places that he found that uh, use the text white supremacy culture. So I'm going to quickly read that. They include the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence to the Sierra Club of Wisconsin. To an, to an organization of West Coast Quakers, to the Minnesota Public Health Association, to an open source software group, to the Los Angeles chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, the Atlanta Roller Derby, and the Society of Conservation Biologists. Um, and that's, of course, just a handful of organizations that use the text. And I think, you know, that's that's all true. I mean, he like did the research and found them. Um, but I think what's actually more troubling than these kind of like one off groups is the fact that a lot of public school uh, departments of education and, you know, schools themselves and universities have adopted this text. So um, I think probably one of the most famous examples of uh, the New York City Department of Education under the last chancellor, Richard Carranza, in 2019, adopted white supremacy culture as part of its training materials. They were actually sued by four teachers who were who, you know, took issue with some of the uh, kind of uh, claims that are being put forward in the text. Um, but I think, you know, in the last year, as I've been saying, um, we've also seen schools, uh, school districts in Oregon and California kind of taking up this text. Um, and I think uh, I, I actually want to show a clip from an Oregon channel uh, because this school district, uh, I guess, decided to take up a program called Equitable Math, which draws very heavily from uh, the tax white supremacy culture. Um, so let's take a look at uh, this video. Is your child learning a math curriculum steeped in racism? That can be a confusing question for some who wonder how in the world math instruction could be racist. K2's Lincoln Graves live in the newsroom with that story. And Lincoln, Oregon has been in the headlines recently when it comes to this topic. Stephen Deb, the Oregon Department of Education recently promoted a micro course offered by an outside party that teachers could voluntarily take called a pathway to equitable math instruction. It's a process that has plenty of support, but Critics wonder how a topic like math could be racist or rooted in white supremacy. It's called a pathway to equitable math instruction, and its methods seek to dismantle racism in the way math is taught. I will admit, though, I mean, to the to the naked eye, the, the proposal is is pretty bold. Oregon State Representative Janelle Bynum, a former engineer and self-professed mathlete, generally backs most of the concepts, including focused learning on diverse figures in math history, something she learned in her schooling. From an equity standpoint, I think if someone looked back on it and they were like, oh, that was equity. But other concepts in the instruction are more controversial. Critics like former Oregon GOP party chair Alan Alley have seized on the claim that white supremacy culture can show up when the focus is on getting the right answer or when students are required to show their work. So I also want to read just a brief line from the introduction of this equitable math program um, because it specifically cites the white supremacy culture text that, that we are talking about. Um, so they write, the framework for deconstructing racism in mathematics offers several or offers essential characteristics of anti-racist math educators and critical approaches to dismantling white supremacy in math classrooms by making visible the toxic characteristics of white supremacy culture uh, with respect to math. Uh, so, so what are some of these recommendations? Let's take a look. Uh, I think, let's see, there are, let me pull it up here. Um, there are things like, let's see, it's a little small, sorry, so I'm going to pull it up on my screen. Um, but there are things like, uh, so these are some of the characteristics of white supremacy culture in math classrooms. There's a greater focus on getting the right answer than understanding concepts and reasoning. Uh, math is taught in a linear fashion and skills are taught sequentially without consideration of prerequisite knowledge. Uh, students are required to, quote, show their work in standardized prescribed ways. So obviously, you know, here these are... Um, 
these are kind of uh, qualities associated with math education that this document has identified as actually being white supremacist. Um, and uh, oh, my favorite uh, is, let's see, where is it? They, uh, they write, superficial curriculum changes are offered in place of culturally relevant pedagogy and practice. So I now wanna share their example of what culturally relevant pedagogy and practice would look like, because it's kind of amazing. Um, so this is, they say, uh, math educators should incorporate true culturally relevant pedagogy, practice, and curriculum. So the example that they give for this is uh, a teacher could say, what are some of your family traditions that you are proud of? Would you be okay if we brought some of those into the classroom? Or they could do an activity in the classroom where they, quote, use Ankara fabric to teach mathematical concepts such as tessellations, fractions, area, percentages, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that this is uh, really amazing. Um, I It's hilarious. Hilarious, and it reminds me a lot, actually, of the kind of, um, I mean, it's so surprising to me that this is new, right? Because it reminds me a lot of the kind of stumbling cultural sensitivity that, like, we were all exposed to in the 90s. Like, I kind of yeah. feel like this is very reminiscent of, like, teachers asking me really loudly, like, what does your family eat at home? Or, like, what right. if, do you, if like anyone is, I don't know, Jen, if you've watched uh, the Boondocks um, ever, <laughs> but the, uh, I mean, one of my favorite uh, moments was you have this white substitute teacher teaching this all black class, and he just starts screaming Harambe over and over, and he's trying to get all the kids to say with him. <laughs> Yeah, so um, that yeah. is also in this document. Right. No, I'm just, <laughs> I mean, essentially, right? Um, I mean, this is this is crazy. This is ridiculous. And um, I, you know, I, when I was browsing the Equitable Math website, I came across their frequently asked questions page, uh, which I also I also want to dip into because uh, they they you know a lot of their frequently asked questions are like, hey, like what's going on here? Is this actually racist? And I think that's a really good sign, right? When you have to have a dedicated section on your website to refuting claims of racism. Um, right. But anyway, one of the questions asks, is this toolkit suggesting different and or lower standards for black and Latinx students? And uh, they write, not at all. To the contrary, the toolkit upholds the principle that access to high quality and standards aligned curriculum and instruction should be universal for all students and understands that this is currently not the case. We are asking teachers to expand their teaching approaches to the benefit of all students. The toolkit provides guidance and resources for educators to reflect on and implement culturally responsive and student centered instructional practices in order to ensure equitable access to grade level standards. Um, and to me, that just seems like a very convoluted way of saying, yes, we do want to implement different standards. I mean, that's literally what this curriculum or program is about, imposing different slash new slash more culturally sensitive or whatever standards. And, you know, I think that we've said many times on the show when we criticize stuff like this, like I'm sure they're coming from a good place or like they probably have good intentions, but I just don't think that this is the way to go about it. I think that uh, we have an obligation to criticize it from the left. And uh, finally, Paul, this is the moment you're waiting for. I want to run a clip from an unrelated, but I think uh, sort of operating in a similar vein, a uh, panel discussion called, let's see, what is this? The Science of Black Teaching. This features a professor at Columbia University's Teachers College. Um, and let's, let's take a look at the type of rhetoric uh, that was on this panel. And I think black people, we are relational people. Mm -hmm. We are people of context. Like it's very Western and European to, to dissect and analyze and take apart things. Whereas mm. Afrocentric schooling or Afrocentric spirituality or African epistemology or ways of knowing, everything is connected. So this is why education is not working for so many students of color because we are context driven people. We can't tell a story without telling the 10 things that happened that led up to that moment. There's no such thing as like thinking isolation, isolating yourself from nature, from your family. Like it's just not part of our uh, ways of knowing and being in the world. So when we tap into the ways that we understand the world, students are able to make wonderful connections and unleash their brilliance and their wisdom. So, Paul, as a member of the uh, relational race, uh, your thoughts on this type of pedagogy? Well, let me let me for I'll back up a little bit and be fair. You know, just go going back to what we're talking about with math. I mean, one way where this has come up where I can I'll 
I'll say it might make sense a little bit. This has come up in the framework of standardized tests, which in general are just bad. But um, there has been a little bit of talk about this with some of the word problems. And I can see where people are coming from where they'll have these confusing word problems. And some of the cultural references are sometimes it is things that literally maybe if you're growing up in North Philly, you've like haven't heard of or understood it. There is kind of sometimes maybe like they'll reference things that are like generally maybe from someone in a middle class suburb. So this talk of like changing that out, I think I'll give some credit there and i could say like you know that that's fine is that the biggest problem we're facing education i don't think so but okay yeah i mean but i mean with that clip i mean when i saw that i just thought about like what what do we if we take that to be true about you know black people we don't dissect and analyze things we can't we don't think abstractly at all like what do we make of people like wb du bois or Mm -hmm. or maybe more a better question what what would someone like him make of this and like you know he was not just a, a great black scholar, but probably one of the greatest intellectuals this country has ever produced. I mean, a, a master of sociology, if anyone has read the Philadelphia Negro, I mean, that is like incredibly rigorous scholarship and a- analysis and documentation. Of course, there are countless other brilliant black scholars I can name, you know, like, ha- how do we explain that? And, you know, of course, education, yes, yeah, should be connected to people's lives and relevant. But it's like, if you want to talk about why is education failing so many black children. I mean, let's just start with the fact that so many black kids are in disproportionately, you know, terribly underfunded schools. I, I talk about it probably almost every show about the conditions, about, you know, overcrowded classrooms, buildings falling apart. Um, you know, somehow it's just not surprising that upper middle class black children are faring better in the education system. You know, it's working better for them because the conditions are better. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something, but Any way you slice this, this is just coming off as extremely patronizing and just Mm -hmm. historically inaccurate. And um, yeah, I I just don't don't know what to make of this, really. I think that to me and, and I mentioned this sort of briefly before, like something that's really troubling to me is it seems to be almost exclusively people on the right who are criticizing this type of rhetoric now. Right. I mean, we touched on this on an earlier show with some of the like ongoing scandal around like critical race theory or what they believe to be critical race theory. Um, And, you know, I think that brings up a a pretty important point, which is why are you and I talking about this? Um, Like I said, I think it's really important for the left to confront this kind of rhetoric head on and to challenge it. Um, I don't like that, you know, because we don't want to seem like we're parroting right-wing rhetoric or whatever, that we just leave this open. Um, I think that creates a vacuum in which the only people who are criticizing this kind of terrible rhetoric ends up being conservatives. um, And the left really has to have an answer. Right. And, and I really, I, I really may be missing something. Someone might explain this to me and like the light bulb will go off, but like, it just honestly seems to reproduce the colonial narrative. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, the colonists and the imperialists are the rational ones. Yeah. The savages are just can't, could not possibly understand science, cannot mm-hmm. progress, or at least cannot progress without the help mm-hmm. of colonists. Um, mm-hmm. This really just seems to reproduce that dynamic. Um, I agree. And I feel crazy. Like, am I the only one that's seen this? Yeah. I know you're with me, Jen. So, well, I mean, I guess that that brings me to, I, or I would be curious, why do you think there is such a silence from the left or like even from liberals and progressives around some of this stuff? I mean, like, like I was saying, you know, earlier, I think at one point it was easy to be like, well, this is just like niche activist stuff. Uh, nobody's really doing this, but we, we just pointed out that public schools are doing this. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, and honestly, this, I think, is something I hope I think Nivedita can probably explain more, but I do think there is a dynamic where over the years things have started in the academy and they kind of filter out through society. And you know, at one point, it was at least much more common that you would have just standard Marxists in the academy. And I think with the advent of you know uh, postmodernism, postcolonialism, poststructuralism, I mean, these ideas have a way of like filtering out, and I've, they've just mm-hmm. become the common sense. And I think. I don't really know. I mean, maybe some on the left feel that, you know, they don't feel like they have some sort of framework for understanding racism or colonialism through through Marxism, and they feel they need to latch on to this. But it does, you know, like you said, sorry, my earphone keeps uh, falling out. But um, maybe 
it, it, it does seem like there's a sense of desperation where it's like mm-hmm. people just Googled this and like it somehow <laughs> got big because they're so desperate to not be racist and like mm-hmm. they're just flailing for an answer here, you know? And I mean, not to get too much, I'm on the tangent, but I do think it relates to like what this whole show is about. Mm-hmm. I mean, to go to another great scholar, CLR James, who it's kind of interesting because Hyper and he, for those that that know, a great scholar from Trinidad, what wrote a lot about colonialism. It's kind of interesting because hyper woke people try to claim him in a way, but he was, you know, I don't I don't agree with all of his work, but he was not very woke and he was very insistent throughout. You know, he was known for talking about colonialism. He was deeply involved with people like Kwame Nkrumah and other anti-colonial leaders. He was very insistent that he was not anti-Western culture. Mm-hmm. He was very insistent that you know, people in the colonial world have adopted different aspects of Western culture, you know, and his great work, The Black Jacobins, about the Haitian slave revolt. I mean, one of Mm -hmm. the profound points he's making is that the slaves in Haiti adopted modern forms of organization and adopted principles of the Enlightenment that they used in their context. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, that's a great book everyone should read. But, you know, that was the point he made. And I think that was a really great framework to look at it. That is not this sort of weird rejection of everything, uh, you know. Right. That is coded Western. Yeah. Right. You know, Um, so I think that's a much more healthier framework. But honestly, I mean, I'm going to sound like an old grumpy old teacher, but I think a lot of people also just don't read. So, again, there's many Mm. people that I'm sure think that CLR James is in line with this stuff that we're talking about, Mm -hmm. you know, the stuff that we disagree with they don't actually know that he's not because they probably just haven't bothered to read it Mm -hmm. i guess so so before we bring nevetta on um i i just want to touch on one last thing which is do you think the right is better at talking to workers at this point than the left um i i I mean that you know we've talked about right-wing populism on this show before that's like kind of a constant fear right that like the right is going to somehow outflank the left on uh issues on on uh you know, issues that it, like bread and butter workers issues, right? Um, I, I have mixed feelings. I'm not sure. Um, but but I want to get your thoughts first, and then I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, I, I mean, I think they're, they're better at talking about it in negative ways. So, mm-hmm. you know, they don't have positive programs. But again, they're good at, at latching on to something outrageous and being right. like, isn't that crazy? And most regular working people be like, yeah, that is crazy. <laughs> right, um, right. <laughs> or, you know, I think, even stuff like family family values like you know they're tapping into like yeah people want to take care of their family Mm -hmm. a lot of people think family is important right Um, where eric foner points out that the word freedom was something that the right Right. like it has absolutely kind of like commandeered as their own uh but foner's argument is that the left like on the left like we should take that back because that's something that you know i mean that like the idea of freedom, of course, has a very long tradition on the left, um, and it's very appealing to a large number of people. Right. And, you know, and not just freedom in the sense of civil liberties, which, mm-hmm. of course, are important, but like, you know, really highlighting that, like, our workplaces are just like total dictatorships. Yeah. You know, for the mo- you know, and somehow mm-hmm. we just kind of accept for the most part, like, once I clock in, like, basically, a lot of my rights are given up until I'm, I'm gone. And I think tapping into the, you know, the workplace should be a side of freedom as well. Right. Um, so. Or even this idea of economic freedom. Like, why does that have right. to be synonymous with, uh, like, unfettered capitalism, right? Like, e- economic freedom, I mean, we should make it mean the freedom to, uh, you know, access a living wage, the freedom not just right. to sell your labor, but the freedom to, uh, you know, enjoy a dignified living. Right. And, and you know, that kind of reminds me, I, I recently wrote an article about in Montana, the labor movement there beat back a right to work bill. And mm-hmm. one of the unions, forget which, I think it was one of the building trades. The guy said, like, you know, most of my members are Republicans, but like the way we framed it was like, you know, the union gives me freedom. I mm-hmm. have the freedom, you know, I can work one job, the freedom to take care of my family without de- relying on anything else. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, and that worked you know, again, these were people that identified as right wing, but they were right. mobilizing against a right to work bill mm-hmm. and using the freedom framework to, to do that. Right. Right.